cool, jel tako? Ok, so, hello, welcome now officially. This is our fourth lecture and practice class combined, all merged into one. So let's do a brief review. Uh, what we did last week was uh, shifts. We finished the uh, discussion on shifts with the second consonant shift, which transformed uh, Germanic, let's say higher Germanic uh, languages, and one of them in particular into modern German. And we had the, its counterpart uh, on the British Isles, the Great Vowel Shift, which transformed Middle English into the modern present day English. Uh, and then we discussed these shifts in terms of how they operate. There are push and pull shifts, those that uh, invade other sounds, the territory of other sounds, and then those sounds that are being pushed, they move to the territory of some other sounds and theoretically you can make a full circle. And there are pull uh, shifts where uh, something just moves into a new position that's not occupied, a sound for example, but then uh, it leaves a gaping hole which needs to be filled and then other sounds move in to fill the hole which usually happens because uh, languages like balance and uh, holes in the phonological system are not okay, the languages like to have evenly distributed uh, sounds. Uh, because of the lack of uh, spoken records from old forms of languages, we very often do not know uh, which of the shifts was which of these subtypes. For example, for the first second, for the first consonant shift, there are ongoing discussions whether it was a push or pull uh, shift. But for example, for the great vowel shift, based on the rhymes and letters and discussions on how people started talking very weirdly, old, you know, people writing to young people, uh, we know that it was most likely a push shift. Uh, but even that is, you know relatively open for discussion. Uh, however, all of this is relevant uh, for maybe a theoretical question. What, when it comes to practical questions, uh, you will have just a small fraction of the sounds, uh, sound changes uh, and shifts that are uh, actually contained in the handouts on the website. So uh, of all the handouts, you should focus on E mutation, breaking, palatalization, assimilation, and meta thesis. Whereas uh, when it comes to shifts, of course, we will only deal with those that are relevant for the development of English and its closest cousin, German. So that means Canton versus Satum shift, uh, the first consonant shift, the second consonant shift, and the great vowel shift. And that's uh, actually two separate questions in the written exam, you already are capable of doing the exercise with the uh, Canton Satin first, second consonant shift. Uh, after today's class, you will also be able to do the exercises on immutation, breaking, fertilization, and the remaining two changes that are listed here. And we also introduced assignment number one, family tree of a word. Uh, since I did not re uh, manage to record, uh, actually I managed to record, but I didn't manage to access the recording. Um, would you like an extension of that deadline or the deadline is still okay? Any thoughts? Unmute Deadline's yourself. Deadline's fine. Deadline's fine. It's great to hear. It's not a big <laughs> exercise. Uh, you can do it in an hour, fundamentally, especially with the links from that um, from the, uh, that are contained in the Google Sheet uh, document. Okay, so we discussed uh, the ongoing issues. So here's the plan for today. We will finish the practice from last week. So uh, we will do uh, a simulation, breaking, and we'll briefly mention meta thesis, and then I will give you an example of what it looks like in the written exam, and you will see that it doesn't bite, and that you can actually prepare for it 
uh, this I have to agree. This is the only question where um, you know uh, there is some analysis to be done. So it's not a straightforward question where you can find the answer in the presentation itself. I mean, you can. All the examples in the written exam are uh, examples from practice classes. But uh, what I'm trying to say is you have to identify the sound change and uh, figure out, you know, which one to focus on in each exercise. Uh, but the good news is there are not so many such um, topics in the rest of the course. The rest of the course is more like, you know, questions about stuff covered in lectures and maybe some examples that we will do on those topics uh, such as borrowing and um, semantic changes. Uh, and after that, we will talk about social factors in language change. Uh, so 10 years ago, this was still considered to be the realm of historical linguistics. These days, uh, all the discussions on social uh, factors influencing language change are being moved away from historical linguistics. And these days, actually these days means over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, this is now considered more or less uh, a well-established separate branch of linguistics, historical sociolinguistics. But until let's say the year 2000, it was still, uh, these were still discussions that were a sub, let's say, subset of historical linguistics. And this is actually a very, very interesting uh, part uh, of these, um, uh, very interesting part of the whole uh, approach to language from the historical perspective, because it turns out language is a social, you know, <laughs> social tool. Uh, for humans, it's the foundation of our society. If you think about it, we, you know, everything you have, to, you know, everything you do, you have to do it with language. So it's the fabric of our society. And it turns out uh, social factors actually have a huge impact on language change. But before we get there, let's dive into practice. So uh, for immutation, e uh, we started doing it in class. And uh, then, uh, using my beautiful handwriting and the pen, I uh, did the rest of it. So there's a key. And uh, every single one of these examples is listed. Uh, actually, there's a number in front of it, which identifies uh, the, the class. So. Um, what I have to tell you is that um, although my handwriting is terrible, I tried to make sure that the numbers for one, two, three, six, and seven are clear. Numbers four and five will not appear in the written exam because these changes assume that you know the paradigms of verbs in Old English. And I cannot assume that you speak Old English and know how to, you know, provide all the forms of uh, weak and strong verbs in Old English. Uh, if you're into that, actually, you will do this with Tanya in the course on, histori on uh, Old English. But here, we will only focus on those ones which, uh, which you can see even today, uh, where you sense that something is weird there. So this is something like uh, foul and filth, uh, food and feed, uh, irregular comparison of adjectives such as old, elder, eldest. That's actually also a mutation. And of course, immutation also occurred in some contexts which are not written here because the suffixes were not derivational. They were actually inflectional suffixes that were lost in time. And the most famous example is uh, moose mice. So mice today is the consequence of immutation. Also, foot and feet, that's the consequence of e-mutation. Uh, most of the irregular forms of that kind, 
mouse, mice, louse, lice, foot, feet. Uh, these are immutation e uh, actually changes. So you have the key here. Uh, I don't know if you did it at home or not, but the key is here. So should I open discussion or we can move to uh, you know the other key that I created that's for palatalization. Palatalization influenced uh, sounds uh, k and g, uh, which were palatalized into ch and y in the context of uh, front vowels such as e and a, but not front mutated vowels such as u. And this is the reason why today we say church and not kirke, which is the said, which is the pronunciation in virtually all uh, Germanic languages, because uh, the West Saxon dialect where this palatalization was most prominent was the most prominent dialect of old English. By the way, why is West Saxon so important? Do you maybe remember this is a common story since the first year and Professor Novakov, you maybe even mentioned it in varieties of the English language. This is one of the first examples of how, you know, uh, different varieties can influence the development of the whole language. Hmm? Does anybody remember the importance of West Saxon versus, for example, Kentish uh, as a dialect? or northern dialects generally, like Scottish <laughs> dialect. West Saxon was the language of, or not language, sorry, the dialect of King Alfred. So King Alfred, who was, uh, you know, the first prominent uh, king who tried to enlighten the population, who was publishing books, translated parts of gospels, and promoted actually literacy uh, to the best extent of the times. Of course, if you were a pig farmer, you didn't see any of that, uh, you know, touch you directly. But uh, it, he was one of the most enlightened rulers. So. West Saxon was seen as the language of education, the prestigious dialect on, on the British Isles, and virtually all the surviving documents of old English are actually documents in West Saxon. Uh, other dialects did not have this uh, palatalization very pronounced. There were a couple of examples of palatalization. I, I, they are listed in the handout. So you can always go to the handout. Let me just show you where in the handout you can see that. Uh, so let me show you a Chrome tab. Uh, so uh, you should see it now. Uh, so, uh, for example, here, this is actually e-mutation. And you can see foot, feet, moose mouse and today mice this is all immutation but uh when it comes to uh palatalization uh actually it's on the top um uh, we have it also in serbian by the way uh you know that tok teci and čovek čoveče uh so this is actually the relevant part uh so um you can see here that West Saxon was different from other dialects. And this actually explains uh, some differences among dialects themselves, but also the fact that you sometimes in modern English have words from the same Anglo-Saxon roots, but with slightly different meanings. The, most famous of them is ship versus skipper. So ship was originally skip in old English. So this is this was pronounced as skip. The C was pronounced as k, k in old English. Uh, so this was skip. Uh, because of palatalization in West, uh, in West Saxon, it was pronounced as ship. But in uh, Northern dialects, the same root was used to create an agentive noun 
like today even print printer you know blog blogger so out of this skip you add er and you get the skipper so you can see that ship comes from west saxon so they were probably the owners of the ships <laughs> they were rich and powerful whereas these poor people from northern parts they were hired to operate ships on the behalf of rich rich west saxon nobility so they were the skippers the similar story is with sheet, the shirt and skirt which is actually the same uh, the same <laughs> the same word in old english it was skirte uh, so this is skirt in from northern dialects and shirt from west saxon dialects and uh there are you know ditch and dike and in northern dialects you can hear some people say kirk kirk for church but that's very rare um normal word for a church is really a church this is actually the normal pronunciation in german kirche and in also icelandic and norwegian uh so in the key you have all the examples but this is actually a super interesting uh sound change where you can see which words came from which of the dialects so if you have palatalization it's west saxon if there's no palatalization it's uh not west saxon it's probably one of the northern dialects but for example that's the reason why you say today they not dog uh, and this G is actually a normal pronunciation in all Germanic languages. Uh, and that's also, for example, the reason why you say fish, but in all other Germanic languages, you have K, uh, etc. Uh, and also this explains bridge, where in all other Germanic languages, there's no J there. It, there's either G or K. Um, so, um, I did uh, the key there, uh, so you can see, and only words which, uh, which uh, appear in this handout will, uh, not this handout, only the words which appear in the presentation and the handouts which you got from the American corner downloaded from the website, these are the actually the words you can expect in your, um, in your final exam. So uh, this was done in class. You should see the, the slides now. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, using my wonderful handwriting, I indicated with these uh, dots above each C or G letter if it was palatalized. So if there's a dot above, um, G, it's pronounced as Y. If there's a dot about above C, it's pronounced as Ch. If there's a combination, this is the one which is uh, here, you know, written it above legion. Uh, C and G in uh, spelling uh, were uh, pronounced as J. So uh, that's also what gave us the bridge, as you saw in the handout. So this is the key. Uh, the good news is uh, that, you know, here uh, there, is, there is no, so in a way I, I tend to very rarely give this in the written exam because I, uh, you know, there's nothing to explain. It is, uh, you know, you, you just have to identify it. So you write, so, you know, you get the word uh, kirike and then church and then you say then you know like explain what happened and you simply write palatalization so uh very easy points but it can occur and maybe i will give you because these are not normal times so you deserve some you know some easier questions occasionally not all the time um okay so uh that was uh that was uh what we did last week now as i said there are five changes that i consider that are crucial that despite the fact that we don't have four classes to deal with this like four weeks for sound changes and some of you don't like sound changes so that's also good because you know not um, you know we will not get bored some of you probably and even me sometimes after four weeks maybe it's too much it sounds like it's 
constantly for knowledge and phonetics. So we will only analyze breaking, assimilation, and metathesis. So immutation, uh, palatalization, breaking, assimilation, and metathesis, nothing else comes, will be, will be uh, there for identification in the written exam. So breaking, I prepared here uh, the chart from uh, the old book that, um, that I was using uh, for a long time. So breaking, you can see it here below immutation. It means that front vowels in front of back consonants uh, that are followed by usually other front vowels, uh, they develop into uh, diphthongs with a front and a back vowel. So if you think about this is a vowel harmony. So try yourselves if you pronounce a like a front open vowel, a, or for example, e. And then after that, you have to pronounce h, very, you know, uh, very throaty sound coming from deep inside your throat, like this h, like you're preparing to spit at some, somebody, h. So this, your, your vowel, I mean, your vocal tract has to move from, uh, a very front place of articulation to very back place of articulation, which is not, you know, you don't think about it, but it's probably unpleasant for your vocal tract muscles. So what breaking actually does, it creates a bridge. So uh, you have this uh, front a vowel or a or e or long forms a, a and e. And when they are followed by these, you know, uh, back consonants, uh, they change, these front vowels change into diphthongs, which contain as a glide sound, a back vowel. So you see, instead of going directly from a to, for example, h or r or w, uh, which are quite back in the, in the vocal tract, uh, you create a, bridge which glides you and you pronounce it easily. So a becomes eo and instead of saying ach, you say each, which is much easier. And the same applies to eo instead of ech and eo instead of ich, which uh, are more strenuous for the vocal tract. So that's that's the that's the uh, that's the sound change, and what you can get um, is that was actually one of the most common sound changes in old English, and we are doing it simply, you know, because we are at the Department of the English Language, and some of you may decide to take the course in the Old English and Middle English, the history of the English language, so this will come in handy. Um, so this is in the second handout. You will recognize it when I show you the next slide. So this is uh, the, the task which deals with breaking. Again, what uh, we can do here is we can organize this into uh, you know numbered boxes. Uh, so let's say that this is uh, you know like. Uh, a numbered table and let me again remind you what this is about so it's about sounds e a and a so front vowels which are followed by back consonants so r or l plus another consonant and H can also cause breaking, but on its own. So H doesn't need another consonant. R and L, they require other consonants. And these front vowels cha change into diphthongs for the sake of easier pronunciation. So E becomes EO, A becomes EO, and E becomes EA. Uh, so, most of these diphthongs, unfortunately, in the present day English are lost because uh, 
Middle English and later Modern English underwent monophthongization of most Old English diphthongs. So this is gone, like 99% of this is gone, but uh, actually Old and Middle English are full of uh, words which have diphthongs in the positions where today you only have uh, a monophthong. So all these examples contain Old High German in the left-hand column and West Saxon, the famous uh, Old English dialect, variety maybe, uh, that uh, that shows the Old English. So West Saxon is actually like Old English, it's just called West Saxon, but that's, that's just a dialect of Old English. And uh, you will see that uh, in many of these words, uh, there is never the, the front open vowel A. Eh. So the reason why that is so is that in Old High German, you had the sound A, ah, which changed in Old English or West Saxon into this open front vowel A. Ah. Uh, so wherever you see A ah in Old High German, it was originally, but we have very few written evidence of that. There is evidence, but a very small quantity because it's a very old form of West Saxon. So in all early days of Old English or West Saxon, this, you have instead of, uh, you have uh, actually uh, this E. Eh, and then this E eh was changed through uh, breaking. So, um, so wherever you see in Old High German A, ah, just imagine that it's actually E eh in Old English. So how do we do that? So for all of these uh, sound changes, there's always the same, you know, you remember the question in the written exam is identify the sound change and explain how it operates. So for all the words that you see here, if one of them appears in the written exam, you will write breaking and you already get one point. Uh, now, since this is not unconditioned, like for example, the great vowel shift, you can explain how it operates. So for example, for uh, the explanation is always the same. You will write, for example, E plus R plus consonant, what's written here actually. So this, this is the explanation, produces air. So can you maybe see an example in the first column of this number one? So you're looking at A, which in your mind is E in Old English, followed by R and the consonant. Arm. Arm, exactly. So arm is one. Then let's look at number two. So number two is exactly above arm. So it's al, uh, which today is pronounced all, but originally it was al. So in all the English, in the early forms, it was l, l. But then because it is followed by uh, l plus another consonant, and here it, there are two l sounds, it was really pronounced, we think, as not L, but L, like Hekkinen, for example, in Finnish these days. So this is actually two. And then the uh, phonological, uh, the explain how it operates is simply E plus L plus consonant, this is L, uh, produces again E. So this is two, and as you can see, the one above it is also number two. Aud, Aud is exactly the same uh, change. Aud is actually a better, uh, a better example. Uh, so um, here you see that these are really two, two consonants, L and D. And by the way, this is the reason why we say old today and not Alt, uh, so not alt like in German, because all or originally this a was uh, changed into a in uh, old English, and this a was monophthongized interestingly to all, not to uh, a or a. 
So that's what gave us today old. Uh, in most other uh, Germanic languages, the word for old is this original uh, alt or alt. So in modern English, uh, it's old, but if you speak German, you know that it's alt. Um, okay, so uh, then number three is exactly the one above it. So this achto echta is uh, actually e plus h, and notice that for h you don't have to write a consonant because as you as I mentioned to you and you see it in the in the top left right corner, uh, h can cause breaking on its own. H was not uh, dependent on additional consonant after it. So this here is c c. Um, that's uh, actually a plus h produces again a and another good example of um, this is for example this fax which produced fair which was old english for hair we lost that word may it rest in peace and yeah by the way the one below it hala hell is actually number two that's uh, the present day whole um okay um so can you maybe see somewhere in the first column an example for number four so that's a plus r plus consonant produces not a but a o erda erda yes erda was old high german and it really sounds like you know something rough like really zemlja but er erda like, you know zemlja je teška uh, then it created eorte and uh, this diphthong today is the reason why we have earth uh, so um, there's there was this uh, added duration there so yes, that's number four. Erda Eorte is number four. Uh, I think that in the first, ah, we do. So we have, uh, now I see it. So there's uh, the number five is uh, the same thing, but with L. So A plus L plus consonant produces L. So, do you see it? It's very close to Erda. El Ajo. El Ajo, yes. And there was a mistake which I fixed with my pencil <laughs> yeah, when I scanned the book. So, El Ajo produced Elch. Elch is the present day Elk. Yes, that's number five. Can you see somewhere number six? Uh, in the first column, you actually have no number six. Actually, almost finished the first column. Uh, barn, Bern is actually number one. So wherever you see A, ah, that's actually E. Eh. So uh, number six is, of course, A alone. Uh, sorry, A plus H which is alone, doesn't need a consonant, produces again ale. Uh, connect. Connect. Uh -huh. Connect. And this word in um, Old English was actually pronounced uh, at the way it was spelled. So every C in Old English spelling was K. So that was Knelt. Knelt, of course, today, can you guess what it is? night there yeah that's the night in the shining armor not night and day but the night in the shining uh, armor and we'll talk about this word it's a very interesting word uh, because in english it underwent semantic change an amazing semantic change but we have this word in serbian usually you hear it in lectures on history my daughter was constantly saying this word in Serbian last year when she was dealing with uh, 
you know, antiquity and middle ages in the sixth grade. Can you guess? Kmet. Kmet. It's Kmet. In Serbian, that's Kmet. Why Kmet means a knight, you know, a nobility in English is a long story, but don't worry, we'll, we'll discuss it when we deal with semantic change. By the way, another example of six, I think I'm just looking at it very actively. Sex. Sorry? Sex. Sex. Yes, in the third column, exactly. That's actually, uh, that's, uh, that's six, number six. Uh, okay, so we are left with only two, uh, you know, uh, sorry, not two, three, uh, more or less identical changes. So we ca covered A, we covered A, the only front vowel that was different, guys, to make pronunciation easier because it was followed by the back vowels was E. So E plus, um, sorry, E plus, uh, R plus consonant produced EO. So this is number seven. And I think we have two examples or maybe even three in the second column, the middle column. Can hirti. You... Hirti, yes, Hirti, which produced Hiorde. Uh, and the same one is actually also the next one, Iri, Iore. So H was dropped, you know that H tends to be dropped in the initial position, not only in English, but in virtually mo all languages, even we in Serbian uh, and uh, especially in dialects, instead of hleb, very likely are going to say leb or lebat, uh, although originally it should be h, right? Hleb, hlebat. Uh, so that's actually also number seven. And number seven is this Lirnojan, so this is actually, can you guess what this is today? Leornian and then later Leornian. Leornian Le is learn. learn. Yes, this is the learn. This is the verb to learn. Uh, and by the way, the one below, Maruch Mearch, this is a mayor, Kobila today. That's uh, number one. Uh, Okay, so I think we ran out of number sevens, at least in the second column and maybe all together in the whole exercise. Uh, number eight is E plus R plus consonant produces, of course, EO again. And uh, this, uh, this example, wow. Is it possible that we don't have it? Oops. Oh, no. Yeah, we don't have it. <laughs> I'm just looking at it. I actually prepared the key to this exercise for myself this afternoon. And now I see there's no number eight anywhere. So, no number eight. But we do have number uh, nine. So, this is E plus H produces EO. That would be, I think you have one example at least in the third column. Can you maybe see it? Tihoyan. Yes, Tihoyan. And there's also Mixt and Mioch in the top one. So, uh, there's, uh, so there are two. Um, uh, some people say I don't quite agree with this, but I'm, but I'm not expert for Serbian that this Tihoyan is uh, related to Tihovati in like religious context in Serbian. Okay, so please, somebody has some music in the background. Yeah, mute yourself. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so I can give you some solutions for the rest of it. I did my homework, so we don't have to spend too much time here. So this is, um, Sverd is number four. 
uh, the already that did uh, uh, yeah so shell is uh, shell is number six I think uh, yes uh, that should be six but I will upload the key uh, so let's not let's not waste too much time because time is limited we are already 50 minutes into this uh, uh, so, just one question, sorry. Uh, huh? For for elaho, mm -hmm. if l if l requires a consonant after, uh, mm -hmm. how how do we have a here? Uh, elaho, but you yes. uh -huh, you don't look at uh, old uh, old High German. As I mentioned, uh, there are some steps which we are missing. Uh -huh. So you see, in old English, you had l and h. So there okay, are okay, two okay. levels. It's like you know, sometimes we have to just take you know uh, educated guesses. Very often, not very often. In most cases, you don't have those intermediate steps where you can see that uh, the original form in old English was something like l. Elf with I, I can't even pronounce it, but not L. Thank you. Elf. Okay. Uh, now uh, there are just two uh, let's say trick questions or three trick questions that I prepared in the second part of this uh, slide, and this has to do with uh, the absence of breaking. Uh, so uh, this. Uh, occasionally features in those six theoretical questions can feature but um actually uh you know it's not very common that i would ask you this also when tanya and i were doing this together when tanya was the uh, let's say lecture and i was the assistant we also very rarely uh, use this in the written part of the exam, but it's interesting for uh, for uh, for discussion. So, can you guess what's the explanation for uh, the fact that uh, well, which is by the way whale today, and uh, smell, which has nothing to do with uh, smell, it's actually small, which you can guess from Old High German. So, this is Old High German. And this is old English. Uh, why uh, there is no breaking? Hmm? As you mentioned, somebody was asking me why you know elaho. Why do we have breaking when there is only l in uh, old High German? So obviously you have to look at old English. And in both of these cases, l as a sound cannot cause breaking on its own and you need a consonant uh, you look only at the old english form for the phonological context so cannot uh, cause breaking on its own uh, now what would be the problem with alfred which of course is alfred that it's we don't pronounce it I mean, this E should have uh, shifted to Ea. So we don't say E Alfred, of course. We say Alfred. Uh, even in Old English, it was Alfred. Uh, maybe when it's at the beginning? Uh, could be. But there's also, look at the phonological context. How many consonants do you have? L, F, and R. So you actually have three consonants. And for some reasons, uh, you know, with three consonants, so three consonants, no breaking. Uh, it seems that these uh, heavy consonant clusters prevented breaking. And when it comes to this, this is an exception this is almighty today so this is simple an exception nobody has uh, uh 
I'm terrible at writing. Um, so it's an exception. What would be language without exceptions? Uh, so with that, we actually covered uh, three of the most common changes in Old English uh, and West Saxon and also most Germanic languages, especially immutation. Immutation is relevant for all Germanic languages and so is palatalization. This uh, breaking is mostly just Old English. But uh, the next one, which we will also cover, and this is, uh, again, the reason why we cover it, because it appears in virtually all languages. We have it uh, also in Serbian. So assimilation. Uh, you have assimilation explained in your uh, handout. I will just briefly switch the... I will switch the view to your uh, to the um, hmm, wait to uh, my uh, chrome tab so you should see my uh, chrome tab uh, so this is palatalization but uh, here at the beginning you can see uh, there's a discussion on assimilation so assimilation is a beautiful story of a compromise in language. So there's a constant war between sounds, like in human interactions, you know, uh, one person wants to have it uh, uh, his or her way, another person his or her way, you know, shall we go out uh, when there's no pandemic to, you know, Lazino Tele, or should we go to some, place at Ribara's constant struggle. Uh, so uh, when two sounds, um, you know, meet, which are relatively different and uh, pronunciation is problematic. So like in real life, there's a problem where to go. Then a compromise has to be made. And this is a simulation. So, uh, everybody usually gives some way but somebody sometimes just simply loses <laughs> and gives up but sometimes there's a real compromise but uh, the conflict is always resolved so there are two different um, possibilities so one is regressive assimilation so the sound that undergoes the change the target comes earlier than the word which is causing the, simu uh, the simulation. So you see in Latin septem, this p changed into t under the influence of t, which comes after it. So it's like p is looking ahead, deciding how it will change itself to meet the requirements of t. Uh, but there's also, uh, but why it's called regressive, it's regressive because t, uh, causes put to change uh, by going backwards. So the influence is going backwards. The progressive assimilation is the opposite. So that's when the preceding sound influences the sound which falls. So the trigger comes before the target. This uh, actually sounds more logical, but languages are not always logical. So that's the reason why Germanic, uh, sorry, I wrote Proto-Germantic, like Proto-Romantic, no, Proto-Germantic, Proto-Germanic, Wulno, which is Wul, uh, so this N was influenced by L, and it changed completely into L. And sometimes there's this reciprocal uh, assimilation where the sounds uh, influence each other. So it's both progressive and regressive at the same time. That's the most beautiful case when, you know, both sounds uh, have a little bit of say in what is going to happen. And in that case, it's a real compromise. In the examples which you saw, it's always the victory for one of these. We call them the... Um, the triggering sounds, the one that causes the assimilation. So uh, 
I will stop sharing this and I will go back now to um, to my presentation. Uh, so just give me a second. Uh, your entire screen is what I'm sharing. So here's a simulation. Again, this is available in your um, uh, handouts, which you could have printed out or taken from the American corner. And uh, here is um, here is the list of words which can appear in the written exam. So again, I did my uh, homework. I prepared uh, also some, you know, like notes for myself. But the most important thing, if you get again this in your written exam, is to identify. Remember, you have to identify the sound change. So you write here that it's a simulation. So you already get one point just for this assimilation. Uh, and then you get another point if you can explain how it operates. Uh, so what I didn't mention is that there are also, so there's progressive and there's regressive assimilation depending on who influences the assimilation. But there's also complete or partial. Complete assimilation is, is the, if the target sound change it, changes both its place of articulation, its manner of articulation to meet the uh, specification or the properties of the triggering sound. But uh, sometimes it's partial, so maybe sometimes only place of articulation is changed. So, uh, Let's look at Vif plus man, which I guess you know what it is today. It's woman. Uh, originally, it was a compound. Uh, so uh, here, uh, what changes is F changes into M. Of course, you always write a simulation. So since F is a fricative, and m is not, and since the place of articulation is different, so this is then complete assimilation. Uh, and you say that it's regressive assimilation. What would be um, the change in hea hiera, which today is higher? Huh? What would you write in the final exam? Hmm? Which sounds were affected? Come on, come on. Uh, yes, so in the in the final exam, you simply write H in Tura. Is it complete or partial? Mm -hmm. Complete, right? They are completely different. Uh, and this is again regressive. Uh, and actually, the next one is exactly the same, so no need to do that. Uh, with Elm plus Boga, that's actually an interesting uh, one. Can you guess, by the way, what, to, what it is today? Stabi bio Elm Boga danas. Elbow? Elbow, yes, that's an elbow. Uh, so uh, here, uh, n changes into m. But notice that for the first time, uh, both consonants are actually the same in terms of uh, you know their type. So the manner of articulation is the same. It's only uh, place of articulation that changes. So here you would write that it's partial assimilation. And uh, of course, this is again regressive. For lar and feo, which is, which produced lareo, which I forgot what it is today. Uh, I apologize, but we can look it up in the dictionary. So uh, the sound th changed into 
R, which is complete assimilation. And here, actually, for the first time, we have progressive assimilation because uh, th was influenced by r, and r comes before th, right? r is here, th is here. So this is finally an example of a progressive assimilation. But now I see that it's 7 p.m. <laughs> So uh, I will upload the rest of uh, this, this uh, you know, the solutions to the rest of it. So uh, there's a g changing into h, there's a d changing into t, and again, uh, the changes into t, and all these uh, examples are fundamentally most of them are complete. There is a partial one, and again, mostly progressive, but there's one which is regressive. So I will upload uh, this um, to the, uh, to, uh, I will upload the, the key to uh, the presentation. I, I mean, I will write it, and you will see it in the PDF. Uh, I will just now uh, show you in your handout with sound changes. Uh, the last change that you can get in the written exam, and that's meta thesis. So uh, you have it in uh, the handout, and it's super cute. Oh no, you see yourselves. That's wrong. Uh, no, 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 not that tab. Wait, I should share my Google Drive tab, right? Uh, yeah, the handout. Uh, so. It's towards the end of the uh, of the whole uh, handout. So here it is, meta thesis. Uh, this is the reversal of two adjacent phonemes, a reversal in terms of the order. So they simply swap position. So Frida becomes third. Uh, Brida becomes bird, cross becomes horse, webs becomes wasp. Uh, and um, Askian in some dialects uh, becomes uh, Axian, uh, which of course today we have ask, but in some dialects it was X uh, or X. Uh, so that's, uh, I think it's very simple to identify, and that's why I, I included it, but also it appears in virtually all languages, and the, the nice thing for the written exam is that it's also unconditioned, so you don't have to explain how it operates, you just have to identify it. So that means that now assuming that you remember most of this or you will uh, learn it we can do uh, the last exercise from this practical part of the written exam and that's actually uh, the one which you will see in a moment here it is it should appear yes it's now on your screens so an example from the written exam uh with this you are let's say ready for 40 percent of your final grade the rest the 60 percent we will cover over the, re the remaining six classes believe it or not we all i counted we only have six classes remaining they shortened our semester beyond comprehend okay i don't want to complain uh let's be positive so here's the example identify the sound change you remember i told you that's the task identify the sound change and the conditions under which it operates so just to get the points the basic points as it's written the uh, below you will always get get you will always get five uh, you know, five pairs of words. Uh, 
one point is for identifying the sound change, one for explaining the conditions under which it operates. And there is an explanation at the bottom if there are no conditions, which is especially true if there's, for example, a shift there. And what you can get here is a great vowel shift. Uh, just you just write unconditioned. Uh, so can you guess what this one is? I mentioned it's a sound change which is responsible for virtually all irregular plurals of the type fo foot, feet, etc. Imitation? Yes. So you write, oh no, my pen reset itself, sorry. Uh, yes, you write E mutation. Uh, in pronunciation, it's E because it was the sound e i also would like to pronounce it i but then some older professors look at me and say oh, no. yeah so e mutation or we can call it among ourselves i mutation uh so how would you describe how it operates here if you look at this, this is not one of those seven types. It's not adjective plus e, though it's not noun plus e, and it's not adjective plus e, and it's not uh, the verb uh, in the past tense or the base of the verb. It's not adjective. It's not comparison of adjectives. So here you would simply write o plus e because it's e mutation, right? <laughs> Uh, o plus E produces A, and that's it. The suffix originally was E, but we have no written evidence of that suffix because it's lost in the early days of Old English before we had uh, written records. But based on other changes, so for, um, for this word, we don't have records, but for some other words, we do. So you simply, you know, you just use your common sense. So it had to be O plus E produces A. What would be Erdo Eorde? We did it today. The sound change which created all the diphthongs in Old English. Breaking. 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 So here you get points just for writing breaking. Uh, and then. Uh, how it operates is actually uh, one of those cells in the table which we had uh, like half an hour ago. So you start with the sound which underwent the change. So it's A. And you remember, uh, there were three consonants which could have caused this. R, L, and H. R had to be followed by a consonant. So you write R and a big C to identify it to uh, indicate a consonant, and it produces L. One point more. What's this? Hepse becomes hesp. Ps changes into sp. Metathesis. Metathesis, and then you say simply say unconditioned. Of course, you can, you know, uh, you can write unconditioned. I would assume that you know that it's put, uh, said that change into sp, but if you uh, really aim for, you know, like to be extra, you know, precise, uh, strictly speaking, you should write pus changes into sp, but it's not necessary. Uh, if you write meta thesis unconditioned, I will know what you're looking what, that you know what you're talking about. Lung length, uh, food feed, uh, feed, uh, also strong strength. All these seemingly, you know, related words were actually all derived in old English, and the change in the root vowel was caused was caused by what sound changed? We can have a repeat of a sound change in this exercise. Immutation. E mutation, yes. As I mentioned, e mutation is super important. 
to to this very day this is alive and kicking in most germanic languages if you speak german this is ich spreche du sprichst ich uh, fahre du fährst this is constantly going on uh, so uh, it's only in english english is actually weird that today it has no uh, immutation most other germanic languages have this change so in, uh, even today um especially you know these northern uh, languages uh immutation but here we can actually explain how it operated so long is an adjective uh that uh is added the edu suffix and you create an abstract noun and in this particular case it's actually the sound a ah plus idu which produces e eh. uh, and after this let's say the most complicated of all uh, examples in the exercise you have a counter climatic exercise where you have to identify what sound change produced I today when in Middle English this pronoun was pronounced as E, which is actually the, the German Ich. We just lost H in Middle English. In Old English it was Ich. Uh, so E into I. Maybe it's not a sound change that we did today. Maybe it's a shift. Great vowel shift. Yeah. So here you don't even have to write the full name. Just write great vowel shift. And of course, you can write and you should write unconditioned. And the beauty of this particular exercise is that you don't even have to write E into I because that's the only sound. The whole word is just one sound. E becomes a different I. Uh, and that's 10 points. So I think that you see that uh, with a little bit of practice, you need something like three or four hours to go through these examples once more before the exam. I think it should be no, there should be no issues. And uh, I know from previous generations that uh, with proper preparation, so there are, you know, they, you know, they do generally very well, even in this exercise and all, of course, in the whole exam, because you usually get eight, nines and eight, nines and tens. Okay, so it's seven and 18 almost 20 minutes past seven we have like an hour remaining so i will now start um the lecture but before i switch to the lecture i think that i should also give floor to you for maybe some questions that you may have about this previous part uh because you know we are closing a chapter in a way so we are now forgetting about the most you know fundamental historical linguistic issues like sound changes sound shifts and we are getting into more let's say from my perspective more interesting and more researchable topics such as semantic changes lexical changes sociological influence changes etc okay the five second rule no questions we can move on uh so social factors in language change and we will make a short pause after 15 minutes because i will have to take some water because i've been teaching a uh, whole day so uh, since you have uh, a course in varieties of english some of this uh, may be familiar to you and i will do my best to skip the parts which are probably taken uh, care of in your course on varieties so you probably know this uh, chart this is taken from uh, uh Aitchinson, Aitchinson's books from 1991 about language change whether it's progress or decay 
uh, so fundamentally what we are uh, doing is a form of analyzing varieties of language it's just that if you sample varieties at different points in this the chronic uh, vertical direction you see how varieties you know maybe you know something that was originally at the periphery may become like the dominant language uh, this by the way happened in english west saxon uh, was the dominant language but today uh, west saxon is not the foundation of modern english it was a different story but i don't want to steal the thunder from tanya and you will hear how english actually developed so these things can happen it's just that if you have enough samples in different points in time you can see how uh, language variation actually causes language change so language variation and the course that you have in language in varieties of the english language it's when you just analyze these things over a long period of time you end up with <laughs> historical linguistics uh so uh and the reasons for language variation i don't know uh because i uh when i was a student there was no course in uh, language varieties in the varieties of the english language uh, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Bidana and Jagoda are the, the two of them, they are teaching the course, right? Yes. Yes, yes I'm pretty sure that you actually know this slide. Uh, maybe not, of course, in this uh, relatively boring gray uh, color, but these are the reasons that also exist for language variation. So language change and language variation happen for more or less the same reasons there are extra linguistic reasons like social interaction uh somebody starts saying kofefe because he's an idiot and then this word comes into language and uh, phonology changes you should never have this consonant cluster in english but now you have it thanks to donald trump kofefe uh, and sometimes it happens uh, you know language change happens for language contact because of language contact so um this this region uh west balkans is actually famous for constant mingling of languages and one of the best examples of language contact is actually albanian uh because albanian contains vocabulary and some syntactic uh let's say constructions that are taken from virtually all surrounding languages including serbian uh so um but the best example of a, a language contact as you will hear later because we will have a special lecture at the end on language contact as a cause of change in uh lang in historical linguistics you will see english is actually the best example and i hope that you will you learn something really cool in that that's that will be actually the last lecture before we prepare for the final exam and of course there are intra linguistic reasons rule extension that's actually what language is really love uh, so there are certain rules that operate on a certain number of lexical items and languages like regularity. So if, uh, you know, this rule applies to a relatively large number of items, but it doesn't apply to some smaller number of items, it will be extended to apply to everything. That's, for example, how... <laughs> how old English uh, verbs, which were uh, actually irregular, uh, became in a way regular today. But that's again what Tanya will tell you. This is very similar to analogy. So language is like things which are, um, which are logical. So if you have a certain pattern in language through analogy, language will try to apply the same pattern everywhere so uh 
this is very similar to rule extension, but analogy doesn't have to be about rules. Analogy can be about uh, the consonant clusters, etc. And this is very similar to transparency principles. So if you have certain rules, uh, native speakers should be able to understand why something happens. If there's some change which is, you know, which is puzzling to native speakers, that change will be er eradicated because languages want to have transparency. So rules should be obvious, at least to native speakers. Sometimes grammaticalization can take place. So if you use the one and the same word in one and the same context, it can become phonologically weak and become grammatically, uh, you know, relevant. That's the story, the most famous story of grammaticalization in the history of all languages comes from English. It has to do with an article. Do you maybe know what I'm talking about? Because it's maybe mentioned by Professor Novakov or some other professors. It's actually how we got articles in English. It's a story of a number. <laughs> Okay, if I tell you, do, okay, let me ask you, what do you think, what is this pronounced as an? Can you guess what one. this means? Yes, one. this is all the English for one. Now, does that look similar to something that you the, know? Two. Uh, well, there is a different story, but uh, indefinite article uh, and its strong <laughs> form an is actually one. It's all the English one. So that's why probably some of your teachers in primary and secondary school told you, and this is true historically also, that uh, if you can say one in front of a noun, you should and you should you can say a. Uh, or un, depending on uh, how the noun begins in what sound. That's actually a story of grammaticalization. So an, the original uh, English number, uh, became a grammatical word. It grammaticalized, it became an article. But the number itself was not grammaticalized, and it developed with other sound changes into one. But the original form, which was grammaticalized, was petrified. It remained the same. And the reason why you say un is simply because grammatical words uh, become, uh, let's say, they're not pronounced uh, the, in the full uh, articulatory power because they are let's consider irrelevant. So you don't stress grammatical words. So it was weakened in pronunciation. So out of the original an, you got an with the schwa, but that's completely logical. And then, of course, there's reanalysis, which is, you probably talked about this with Professor Prcic when you talked about, I guess, morphology and semantics of words. Hamburger is a perfect example of reanalysis. Uh, you know, it was just a town, but now burger somehow means a bun uh, and naturalness uh, you know sometimes some forms in language sound very natural so the interesting thing is that in language change social interactions and language context so these extra linguistic uh, factors can cause or let's say accelerate but sometimes also stop some of these intralinguistic factors at play. And social interactions can cause uh, some of these uh, intralinguistic, uh, let's say, processes that are constantly happening in language because it's evolving naturally. Uh, it can cause uh, them, some of them to stop and some of them to be faster, some of them to be diverted in a different direction. And this is, I guess, what you talked about in the course on varieties of the English language. So 
it's the constant interplay. You have these linguistic variables and social variables. So who is the speaker? What is his social status? Is he talking to president-elect uh, Joe Biden or he's talking to redneck in the, you know, uh, landscaping uh, shop? Uh, so these so social variables uh, that uh, change in language use correlate and interact with linguistic variables, so structure, and pronunciation and morphology and semantics etc and through this interplay you either get uh, you get some kind of variation if uh, this variation occurs in only in one language in one part of let's say language community you get variation that's you know british people pronounce it one way american people pronounce it a different way australians pronounce it yet another way or if the whole community uh, accepts the variation and something happens in the whole language community, then you get a change. So that's why I told you variation and language change are actually one and the same thing. It's just about where it happens. <laughs> if it happens to the whole language, you get language change. If it happens in one variety but doesn't spread to the rest of the language community, it's a variation. Uh, but the principles are exactly the same. So in a way, everything, again, I don't know how you, the course is organized with Bidan and Jagoda, but variation as a course can be very useful for uh, some parts of historical linguistics, especially this part that deals with uh, socially induced language change. So I will not go into these linguistic variables that you probably talked about this with Bidana and Jagoda, that there are phonological, morphological, syntactic, semantic, and lexical parameters, and uh, that they change depending on speaker variables. So uh, you may decide to pronounce something differently if you are in a formal situation and you know that you are, for example, not so well educated, but you want to get a job, you want to sound very educated, and you start pronouncing it the way you think it should be pronounced. And this can lead to some really funny situations. The best examples of that are, for example, in Nushic and Gospodja Ministarka, when you know, some people there try to sound educated but they are actually not educated uh, and also sometimes uh, the language change um, is caused by uh, speaker variables that are not social class and for example whether you come from uh, you know a far away backwater of texas or you're coming from new york city sometimes gender age and ethnicity things to which you know which are common to all people, you know, there's, this is not about whether you were born in this place or another, you are always of a certain age, you are always of a certain sex or gender, and you were born into certain ethnicity, this can also cause um, changes. And uh, I want to show you uh, how it happened, how social factors influenced the language change, first in social networks one of the key issues in uh, change versus variety is how far the new development in language spreads if it spreads to a small group of people you have variation if it spreads to the whole language and eventually everybody uses this innovation you get the language change and in order to spread the innovation you need networks. People have to, you know, introduce the new form in a language, new, you know, new uh, syntactic form, new pronunciation, something like that. It has to reach a critical threshold of speakers to be accepted by the whole community, and then you have a change. If that doesn't happen, you have uh, a variation. Sometimes, you know, families have their own pronunciation of certain words, but this is idiolect. 
or e-collect so small groups sometimes you know um, a certain village has you know its own uh, variety of uh, lexical items etc but that's not language change that's only variation so that's why networks are important uh, so um, we don't have time to go through these slides but i will upload them so what we are doing here what you will see uh, was analysis of let's say macro variation so core um, uh, that's variation across multiple social strata and uh, these you know this kind of analysis of network can you know if they can have quantitative approach where you identify and count features that you know that uh, change in different contexts uh, by different speakers and then you can do qualitative approach you actually have to do both so when you see what changes by what speakers in what context you have to do a qualitative uh, approach to identify the reason why those things change in those contexts etc uh, and um, so uh, and social networks are always you know groups of they have members uh, they are groups and uh, in every social network, there's an anchor. That's uh, when you draw a social network, uh, you know, with these dots and lines connecting the dots. Anchor is the node with the highest between a centrality. It sounds terrible, uh, highest between a centrality, but that means that most connections lead to that node. For example, in this lecture, I am the anchor because, um, you know, I'm doing most of the talking and the relationship that links us all in this group is actually this course, which I am teaching. So I would be the anchor. Uh, but uh, this uh, network that we have here has very low uh, or maybe not so low density that's uh, the density is how many ties each node each node is a person in the network has to other nodes you are from the same generation so this is not like coursera where for example if i decide to teach at coursera or udemy i will have people from all over the world who don't know each other here in your case actually the density is probably uh, relatively high you go out together at least some of you uh, you you know you follow and like each other's posts on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok or something like that, and uh, you know you can analyze these things in many ways. So these are uh, what I mentioned: ties, which can be dense, and also plex. That's uh, so density is how many ties you have. Uh, proportions of ties in a network relative to the number that is possible and plexity is actually the number of uh, different social connectors between two nodes so if you have only one link like we are in this course together that's actually low plexity but if you go out together if you take i don't know guitar lessons together if you go to a movie theater not possible these days together then the plexity is bigger so it's not just one sort of interaction there are many sorts of internet interaction where you two uh, are uh, in contact so that's uh, that's the network and for example, this is a low density uniplex network. That's for example, if you have a course at Udemy, nobody knows each other. They all know just the teacher and that's it. Low density uniplex network. Uh, what this course is probably like uh, is more something like this. Uh, so there are multiple links between you as, you know, students. So you also had several different, uh, you know, courses with me, gay one, gay two, and especially at MA level, you know, so I could be a mentor for some of you. So there are different connections leading to me, and this would be high density multiplex 
network. So why is this important? Because it turns out that there was one very interesting social network that brought about a, a very important change in the English language. You will have more slides, but let me introduce you. So this is a study on Saudi Coleridge social circle. So you know this from um, your courses in uh, literature. Uh, you know that Coleridge was one, let's say, the most prominent member of a whole group of um, writers uh, who were uh, who had a very peculiar approach to aesthetics and artistry in general. So the Saudi Coleridge social circle was a very, um, you know, uh, very closely tied. They all had a very similar social and educational background. Their local backgrounds were similar. They were from the same parts of the country. Their political views were the same. They also shared the same literary ambitions, cultural norms, and they developed their own literary production and style. So this is from a book now, a, a, a quotation. So this was in Bristol, by the way, where the group operated in 1790s. So members of the group read each other's most recent work, annotated one another's manuscript, contributed to each other poems, dedicated books or individual works to one another, produced joint volumes, and at times their styles are so like that, as in the case with sonnets jointly written by Coleridge and Saudi in uh, 1970, oh, it's actually 1794, 1795, sorry, I made a mistake in copying and pasting and rewriting. It's literally impossible to tell where one's, one author's contribution end and the other's begins. And they also had, um, you know, additional uh, ties, which I also, you know, mentioned here. Uh, so uh, they also, some of them became in a way, family, you know, started dating uh, each other's brothers and sisters. They lived also in co close physical proximity. And uh, according to linguistic analysis, for their immediate contemporaries, the Saudi Coleridge, cir uh, Coleridge Circle formed a readily identifiable network. Moreover, they constituted a grouping whose linguistic, generic, metrical, stylistic experiments were perceived as a tax on the classical and genuine composition of literary culture and the on the body politic itself. So they wanted to cause havoc in the established circles. They were the revolutionaries. So what did they do to the English language? Uh, you know, sometimes you need to stand out. Uh, we know that from Shakespeare. Shakespeare gave us several hundred new words, which he coined because uh, he knew, although he was not a linguist, that, you know, when you hear a new word, it catches your attention. So you have to create something new in language so that you catch other people's attention. It's a psychological trick. So they also experimented with language and with constructions that were considered uh, ungrammatical even at the time, but they used them on purpose to sound different, to show that they despise these official, you know, artists who have, you know, access to uh, money and court, etc. So this was a linguistic variable. It was about passive. Uh, in the uh, active voice, you would say a barber was pulling out his tooth. Now, if you wanted to make that sentence in the days of Saudi Coleridge Circle, if you wanted to make that sentence passive, uh, you had two possibilities. You could say his tooth was pulled out by a barber. Notice that ing was not there. Or you could say his tooth was 
pulling out by a barber, both of these today would be either terribly ungrammatical, like he, his tooth was pulling out, or uh, considered uh, a transformation which is not simply about the passive voice. This His tooth was pulled out. You know from your course in the first year that you would lose a point if you wrote this in the passivization exercise because you lost the progressive aspect. So, in other words, at the time when Saudi and Courage were coordinating their network, it was not possible to create what we know now as the passive prog progressive. His tooth was being pulled out by a barber. That was not available. It didn't exist. Uh, of course, you know that this is happening in the 18th century, the second half. So English is still developing uh, some things that we take for granted from the 20th century were still not there. And this was one of them. Uh, uh, and then uh, suddenly, uh, after just several years of the strong activities of uh, the Saudi Courage Circle, you start finding examples such as I have received the speech and the address of the House of Lords, probably that of the House of Commons was being debated when the post went out. So this is from 1772. And uh, people who uh, devoted their entire lives to analysis of these networks noticed something like this. So you can see that this uh, uh, semi-passive expression, this his tooth was pulled out or his tooth was pulling out. Let's call it the pass passival form. This is the one with the triangle. Uh, it was a more common form in the 17th and the early 18th century. The progressive passive did not even exist in the early period uh, of this chart. So there's zero progressive passive from 1650 to 1799. And then suddenly, uh, as you can see, the progressive passive starts increasing in frequency and the passival passive starts dropping. And after only uh, two generations from, or actually maybe four generations, from 1800 to 1899, the passive passive is gone, the progressive passive is there. So this is actually what Courage gave us, not only literature, poems, uh, Courage uh, and Saudi Courage Circle gave us the progressive passive. They thought that it was a neat construction to annoy, uh, you know, people in the established artistic circles. And these are some of these examples. They actually tried to use it heavily. Never mind his own flesh and you like a fellow whose uttermost grinder is being torn out by the roots, you see, is being torn out. Uh, while my hand was being dressed, you see, progressive passive, to a pig while his nose was being bored. They use this progressive passive even in titles of poems simply to annoy people uh, because that was part of their artistic, let's say, expression. Uh, and uh, you have other examples here too. Uh, the pitiable uh, infirmities of old men are being acted before us, are being acted. Um, and uh, this is from that same book that I keep uh, quoting from Pratt and Denison from 2000. So here you have a quotation. The Saudi Corrid Circle in Bristol in the 1790s formed a small scale, a dance and multiplex network which might have promoted idiosyncrasies. And nowadays we know that it's not might. They did promote idiosyncrasies of usage as part of their group identity. Whether conscious or not, I think it was subconscious, but the progressive passive was one such usage and seemed to have a political or social in 
significance. And the progressive passive was already a general, if unrespectable form, but it was seized by these young iconoclasts as a kind of radical experimentation. And they are the ones who made it widely acceptable. And here you can see how one social group can extend its influence through a social network to other people because they were artists and people were reading their poems, their pamphlets, uh, their uh, you know introductions to different works of art, their reviews. So there was no Facebook, there was no TV. It was a big deal what these people would write. It was considered uh, avant-garde, radical. Young people loved it. Old people hated it, but they still read because they wanted to see what they were talking about. And this gave us the progressive passive. So, for example, what can you get as a, as a question in the written exam? Uh, provide an example of a social induced language change and explain how it happened. So, in this case, you would write uh, the development and the introduction of the progressive passive is an example of social induced language change where a group of closely knit uh, young artists use the progressive passive uh, as a form of radical artistic experimentation, but it was seized by the rest of the community for its social and political significance and became a regular form uh, uh, and replacing the original passival uh, or passival um, it could be the right pronunciation passive passival yeah passival uh, construction so that's one possibility but uh, there are many other possibilities and we didn't make a break so I will then continue although my throat hurts a bit uh, so we will stop uh, at 8 10 uh, because you know we didn't make a break so we'll stop five minutes earlier so i want to show you uh, another example of the socially uh, induced uh, language change so of course we can talk about social class and how social class influences language variation but uh since we have only 20 minutes remaining uh, I won't. I cannot go into details, but uh, I also think that probably uh, Bidana and Jagoda told you about social class and its importance in sociology, sociolinguistics, historical linguistics, and whole, historical sociolinguistics. It's a speaker variable, and it's defined as the education, economic status, social privilege status, and social networks. And here, the social networks are, again, important because depending on the social class, you may be tied to more nodes in the social network. The more uh, you rise in the social hierarchy, the bigger your influence in the social network. Uh, so that's why social class is so important because people are more likely to hear what the president is saying or the king in the old days than what Pera Lozac is saying. So uh, that's the importance of social class. And what's also important is that we all, by definition, want to belong to higher class. Some of us may not admit it, but subconsciously, we all want to be associated with uh, higher social classes. And also, we know that in language, higher social classes, especially in the English speaking world, are associated with a certain language variety. Uh, so uh, here, what I'm referring to, and again, you may have, you must have heard about it from uh, Bidana and uh, Jagoda, uh, but uh, Labo, William Labo, was um, uh, the first who did big research on this, and uh, he noticed that, uh, you know, um, people in some parts of uh, New York uh, were dropping R 
So that uh, was being dropped. Uh, but then, uh, you know, he was, uh, he told people, uh, okay, so I'm conducting a research on, um, you know, pronunciation in New York. I would like you to, you know, I will, you know, record you as you speak casually. I will see how you speak, you know, formally. Then I would ask you to read passages, uh, word lists, and finally word pairs. Uh, and look what happens. This is actually the example of this social class at work. And this is how it can cause language change. In casual speech, lower middle class and working class they are really casual and the percentage of our inclusion is extremely low uh, you can see it here um, yeah so um, and then as you move down the uh, x axis the horizontal axis and as the situation becomes more and more formal so that you are ultimately uh, reading word pairs where you have to really, you know, pronounce it properly, look what happens. It is the lower middle class which tries their best to sound proper. What does that tell you? how do you how do you understand that upper middle class and working class they try but they do not try as hard as lower middle class anybody do you have an idea or you're too tired maybe because it's almost eight but this is actually the explanation for many changes in language <laughs> huh this is the official explanation from Labov, but the digest of it. Working class and upper middle class, they know that they probably reach the apex of their lives. They are working class people or they are upper middle class people, but they will never become working class, will never become, you know, upper middle class overnight, and upper middle class will not become billionaires overnight. So they are, in a way, happy where they are they are trying to sound proper but they know that the chances of you know going up in the social hierarchy is very small for them lower middle class are the group of social climbers they think that they can go up they are not happy with where they are so they try hardest to be associated with more prestigious form of the language. So that's the ex explanation. And what's also interesting is that this is not the same for both genders. And this is politically incorrect these days. There are no, this is not binary, right? Uh, LGBTQ rights. But Labo was dealing with the binary opposition. He only identified men and women. Notice something uh, that somebody else later noticed. This is actually from Tradgill, from walking and talking in Norwich. So uh, the wrong pronunciation of uh, this um, sound n at the end of uh, progressive forms. So lower working class men, when they are reading word lists, they uh, manage to get it right when uh, in about 70% of cases. But lower working class women get it right in more than 90 percent of cases so the percent of irregular walking forms drops to below 20 percent when lower working class women start reading these word lists so uh you can see uh women are more susceptible to these linguistic features and how different linguistic how different varieties are associated with different social 
standing in the society. Men do not care, or actually they don't care enough, or they don't care a lot. So women here are actually uh, the ones who care about uh, the proper forms of language. And again, you can see that it always happens for those which are at the bottom of a particular uh, social group. So lower working class women are social climbers. They want to become at least middle class or upper working class uh, people. Uh, and this uh, actually uh, gave us so this this uh, fact that lower classes try to speak differently and try to you know modify the language. Uh, but the key word here is in line with what they think upper classes would say. They don't always know what upper class people really talk uh, like in a uh, casual context so they have a concept of what is like proper language and women are the ones who uh, strive the hardest in that uh, context so this um, is actually a case study in uh, changes from above and changes from below so this is what labov says Changes from above are introduced by the dominant social class, often with full public awareness. Normally, they represent borrowings from other speech communities that have higher prestige in the view of the dominant class. Such borrowings do not immediately affect the vernacular patterns of the dominant class or other social classes, but appear primarily in careful speech, reflecting a superposed dialect learned after the vernacular is acquired. So in other words, changes from above are changes from the top, where somebody in a high social position uh, simply imposes something on the rest of the language community. And over time, vernacular starts picking it up because higher classes insist on it. Changes from below are actually usually innovations. So changes from below are systemic changes. So it's not that somebody simply decides one moment, ah, you know, we should speak like this, and then uses, uh, you know, the high social network and the social power to impose this thing. To be bio, change from above je pravopis, kad vam neko uporno tvrdi da morate nešto da govorite na jedan način. Changes from below are what in Serbian we would consider like uh, irregular forms, but they are coming from vernacular and they represent the operation of internal linguistic factors. That's real language change happening at the edges of the language community. Uh, so they are below the social awareness of most of the people. No one really important originally notices these things. Nobody talks about them. And only linguists may notice these things. But when these changes spread through, let's say, a mass of lower working class people who constitute, let's say, 60% of the population, suddenly other members of the community become aware of them. And at that point, without huge amount of power and effort, uh, there is no way to prevent them from spreading to the whole language community. And even highest ranking members will eventually give in and start using these new innovations which came from below. So let me show you just two examples which i think will be will show you exactly what i'm talking about mm. i just have to find them because i have more than a hundred slides and not enough time to show them all but this is an example of uh change from above so multiple negation uh multiple negation existed in English I and mean, even today exists in most varieties of English. 
because it's uh, in most substandard varieties of English because it's logical. It's, only English doesn't allow multiple negation. So the reason why multiple negation disappeared in English is because very influential people with a high social ranking, scientists, uh, theologists, etc., they were studying mathematics and they said, okay, wait, in mathematics, if you have two minuses, it's a plus. So we should not allow multiple negations because they are illogical. Let's fix the language. And you can see here how men and women originally in the late 15th century used multiple negation more or less in the equal proportion. Then in the early 16th century, scientists started insisting on this, that it's illogical to use multiple negation because two minuses is a plus. We should have a single negation in an English sentence. And you see, this is, uh, you know, there's no nice way to say it, but uh, societies before the 21st century were highly uh, male-centric. Uh, men were, had uh, the social capital and the social power. And women uh, um, were actually then following it, but we can imagine that men were constantly saying at that time, you should be speaking like this, not like that. And over several generations, eventually you see that women uh, get more or less to the point of men in the sense that multiple negation is completely gone. So this is a change from above. Uh, this is the change which was imposed on the language community. And here you can see that um, in this particular case, women uh, were following the trend set by the higher, it's not nice, I know, but at the time this was the higher social group of men. It was a terrible period back then. Uh, and of course, I should also warn you that uh, there is a very big problem in all these studies, and I can show it here. This is uh, the diagram that represents not literacy. This is illiteracy rate in the history of English. So in the times when we are looking at these changes, you can see that almost in the beginning, in the 16th century, almost 98% of women were illiterate. By the end of the 17th century, that falls to around 80%. And uh, at the beginning of these periods, when we see these changes, about 10% of men are actually literate. 90% of men are illiterate. And that percentage falls to around 70, 65% by the beginning of the 18th century. So everything that we know about these changes and how social classes uh, interacted and caused changes is actually from a very small sample of those who were literate, whose letters survived, and who cared to write about something that can be used for linguistic purposes, like noticing that people in the market started speaking in a very weird way. So this is like a disclaimer. So everything that we know is based on a very small sample, and we never really can tell what was going on in the majority of uh, people uh, speaking back then. But this is another change where you can see a change from below. And this change was caused by uh, innovators in language, and these were women. So in Old English, uh, uh, there were two words for you, actually three words for you. There was thou and accusative and dative thee, which is cognate with German do or the French to. Uh, and that was only used to address a single person. It was, uh, and it was, um, let's say, informal. Someone you knew well or who was a lower in status would be thou. Uh, 
and uh, this DAO had the plural form ye. And when you were addressing a group of friends, social equals or inferiors, you would say ye. Ye was also the second person objective case. And you was the subjective uh, uh, case. So you was used to address people of higher status and was a respectful uh, pronoun like French vu or German Z or Serbian V versus T. Uh, and uh, this you, uh, you remember what I told you, women, especially this is what Tradgill and Labov show us, women uh, care more about the proper forms of language than men. Men are just drinking and, you know, watching football matches. Women are more careful there. So women uh, being more careful uh, started using you in more contexts than, uh, you know, was originally, you know, you was used in because this was an effort to be polite and to use the proper language, etc. And here in this chart, you, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So in the early 16th century, the year 1500, again, based on the number of letters from men, men and women from that time, which is a very small proportion of people, uh, we see that they start more or less equal. So women actually use you uh, to a slightly smaller extent than men. And then in the period of only 40 years, two generations, uh, the frequency of you used in other contexts, so this polite form you, jumps up. Children, you know, women are teaching their children you should be polite. You should not say ye or ye, you should say you, that's the better form. You don't know who the, you know, what the status of that person is that you're addressing. Use you, you know, mothers teach their kids how to speak. And the frequency increases significantly. And you see, as women become mothers and uh, their children acquire the language, men start following. And after fundamentally just three or four generations, you have a complete change. Ye is gone. We only have you. So this is a wonderful example where you can see how you uh, was introduced uh, for, as a change from below and how women in this case were the innovators. And uh, this is a very interesting topic. There are many ongoing changes in language which can be explained as changes from above, changes from below, uh, you know, uh, women being innovators in the language community and political superclasses being, uh, you know, um, in charge of some weird rules that, uh, are imposed on the language community and then people do not accept it easily. But uh, we actually ran out of time. But I think that, uh, you know, you can use these examples in your written exam. So if you have to provide examples of uh, so, uh, socio, uh, social factors in the language change, you can use Saudi courage circle, you can use the changes of you versus ye as a change from below introduced by women or you can use uh, the disappearance of multiple negation as a change from above introduced by men and scientists uh, and of course if the question is uh, provide an example of a change from below that would be uh, you know distribution of you and uh, you taking over ye if you have to give an example of a change from above, that's multiple negation and its disappearance in language as a change from above. So questions, comments. Uh, I personally like historical sociolinguistics a lot. This is something that where you can still find some amazing things by analyzing old letters or not so old letters. Historical sociolinguistics can also look at short diachronies. So you can compare 
stuff from 1950s and 2020s and this would be uh, still considered historical sociolinguistics as long as it's not five or ten years that's too short a period so uh before we wrap up any questions comments i will upload all the slides there is way more in the slides but as i mentioned we don't have enough time no questions no comments okay i hope you liked it i don't know if you liked it but i personally love this part uh okay so i will stop uh recording and hopefully 